podcast, the Burroughs of Berea podcast, and I want to thank Pastor Curtis and uh, for all of you for allowing us to come here uh, and hosting us here when we did our recording event this weekend. We believe it was a great success. We're able to capture testimonies, which we feel are very important for other believers to hear what God's done in their life. And so thank you all so much for allowing us to be here. It means a lot to us. And if you would, please stand for the reading of God's word. And I will read it as soon as I can see where I'm supposed to be reading from. (laughs) I will be reading. Matthew. I'm sorry. Today, Bob will be teaching on why is preterism important. And so we'll be reading from Matthew 24, 29 through 35. Straight ahead. Thank you. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender, that even as Christ was raised up out of the dead through the glory of the Father, so also we in newness of life might walk. For if we have become planted together to the likeness of his death, so also we shall be of the rising again, this knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of the sin may be made useless. And puts out its leaves. That was was awkward. Uh, As I was... Yeah. You were meant to hear that this morning out of order. And, (laughs) And puts out its leaves. You know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. And so will the the screen. (laughs) Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That's something else I I want you guys to know. I love this church and I watch online and I long to be here. And now I know why. I love this group. (laughs) So if you will, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for this congregation and for allowing me to find them and for them being so welcoming to me. Thank you, Father, for that. Also, God, for this, this group of people that love your word, that study it, that believe it as it says, and they share it with others. God, please be with Bob this morning as he brings this message. It's so critical to us that we learn and that we share with others. And I'm thankful for all the things that you've done for us this weekend and carry everyone back home safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Rick. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> I'm like, you're reading it. I'm like, we went from Matthew to Corinthians and a little blurb in, yeah, a little blurb in there. And then, yeah. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> Rich and Holly came down, came from North Carolina to do the podcast here. We had an awesome day. Friday night, yesterday, we spent listened to testimonies. We, uh, we have all my favorite preachers in this room today. I mean, it's just incredible, and only one of them gets to preach, so I don't know how that works out, but you know, maybe we need to have a marathon, and when y'all, next time you all come, we'll just do back-to-backs. So we'll have a mini-conference or something, but you know, Mike Sullivan's here, Glenn Hill's here, Bob's here. It's like, what in the world? You know, this is a... Uh, do what? Yeah, your feelings are hurt. <laughs> but it, uh, it has been a great weekend. I had so much fun yesterday just discussing Scripture. We had a roundtable discussion on the Millennium. That was just absolutely awesome. So we appreciate you all coming. We've had a great time. At least I have. I've had a great time. This is an annual thing for Bob. It seems like it's getting to be at the end of July. He comes down. He, he can't make it conference to conference. You know, he's got to have some pr- outlet in between there. So... <laughs> So we give him an opportunity to come and share with us, and he always does a great job. Before he comes up here, though, let me, we're having um, Moses coming in and catering. We're having a fajita bar. Moses? Moses. Moses. And we're having manna. (laughs) Moses. Moses. Mose, 
is <laughs> coming in and catering, and we're having a fajita bar after, so I hope you all can stick around, fellowship, talk scripture, harass the pastor, do, do, <laughs> do whatever. All right, the last time Mike spoke, he, uh, he knighted Bob as the blue collar scholar. So that, that is sticking, and that is his, that's his title from now on. So Bob, blue-collar scholar, come on, brother. <laughs> well, actually, normally, because of my occupation, the collar is usually brown, but I wore blue for the occasion <laughs> since since Mike gave me that title, and when David said all his favorite preachers were here, I didn't realize that I was just the warm-up act for Moses, so uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to hear what he has to say, but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't know if this is what Moses is going to talk about, but uh, my, my topic is, why is preterism important? Um, How many of you have ever shared preterism with your friends or family members and they ask questions like, why is this important? Why do I need to know this? Or how does this apply to my life? Oftentimes, I'll get this one. Well, if this is true, what are we supposed to be doing now? And, or why are we even here then, you know? And it's like, That always strikes me as funny because they say this as if there's no point to our existence other than sitting around waiting for Jesus to return. It's as if our only goal in life is to get raptured out of here. But there has to be more to the Christian life than sitting around waiting for the rapture. And indeed there is, and this is precisely why preterism is so very important. So, let's look at the first two questions and start there. Preterism is important, and we need to know this because the subject of eschatology occupies more space in the New Testament than any other. And by eschatology, we mean the study of the last things. It's the branch of theology that's concerned with end times or apocalyptic stuff, so to speak. And eschatology shapes the way we think, the way we live, and the way we conduct our lives. This is because ideas have consequences, and our ideas about eschatology have very real, tangible consequences for the way we live our lives. And while most believers may not be familiar with the technical term itself, everyone has an eschatology whether they realize it or not. All of those believers who are waiting for the rapture and who are caught up, no pun intended, in the hype of thinking we're living in the last days definitely have an eschatology. And the way they live is a consequence of their ideas about eschatology. Now, according to R.C. Sproul, two-thirds of the New Testament is either directly or indirectly eschatological. Likewise, James Montgomery Boyce says, in the New Testament, one verse in 25 deals with the Lord's return. It's mentioned 318 times in the 260 chapters of the New Testament. Ray Stedman says the second coming is the most frequently mentioned truth in all of the New Testament, and Wayne Jackson says it's referenced eight times more often than our Lord's first coming. Now, in spite of all this, amazingly, one famous scholar says the study of eschatology is, quote, a waste of time, end quote. Well, if this is true, then two-thirds of the New Testament is a waste of time, and we should just skip over the 318 times the subjects mentioned in its pages. You see, the real problem for these folks is that within those 318 times, 
that eschatology is the topic, there are 101 time indicators telling us that the day was at hand, the time was near, and the events were to happen shortly before that generation passed away. That being said, another objection I've heard with regard to studying eschatology is the idea that we should major on the majors and minor on the minors. But the fact is that the Lord's return is the major theme in the New Testament, and a major part of that major theme is the fact that it would happen before the first century generation passed away. These things being the case, to ask why is this important or why do I need to know this is to ask why the New Testament itself is important and why you need to know it. The short answer is because it's God's Word. And having said that, with regard to the next question, it applies to our life because we're all called to defend His Word. Peter says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, being always ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that is within you with gentleness and with respect. Now, it's important for us to realize that Peter isn't writing to an elite group of scholars or theologians here. If you back up in the previous verses, he's addressing husbands and wives and giving instructions on normal, everyday living and personal relationships. In other words, he's writing to everyday believers, just like you and me. We are all called to give a defense of the hope that is within us, a, def a hope that's based on God's Word. And the word for defense here is apologia, and it's where we get our word apologetics from. What this means then is that God expects each and every one of us to be engaged in apologetics, to defend the faith. And we're supposed to be always ready at all times to do this, in season and out of season. With this in mind then, there's nowhere that the New Testament is more greatly attacked today than in the area of eschatology. So this is where we need to mount our defense. For example, according to James Tabor, a professor in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, the messianic apocalyptic eschatology of the New Testament, as he labels it, has a 100% failure rate. The prophecies of Jesus and his followers all came to nothing. Elsewhere, he says, John the Baptist, Jesus, James, Peter, and Paul all lived and violently died with the imminent hope of cosmic reversal on their lips, but what they most expected to happen never came about. So, what are we to make of this disappointment and failure, he asks. With Schweitzer, he says, I see Jesus as a full and willing participant and key agent in these failed apocalyptic hopes and dreams. Now, what's really ironic about all of this is that it was precisely these prophecies of Jesus and his followers that used to be used as an apologetic to defend Christianity rather than a vulnerable point to attack it. In 1805, 25 years before John Nelson Darby introduced the world to dispensationalism, George Peter Holford wrote the book, The Destruction of Jerusalem, an Absolute and Irresistible Proof of the Divine Origin of Christianity. In Gary DeMar's write-up for the book, he says, You wouldn't know it by perusing the shelves of today's Christian bookstores, but there is a vast body of scholarly and evangelical literature that shows that most of the New Testament's prophetic passages were fulfilled in the events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. 
A splendid example is Holford's The Destruction of Jerusalem, first published in 1805. Prior to the rise of dispensationalism, the Olivet Prophecy was used by Christian apologists as positive proof that the Word of God was true. Today, that same prophecy is used by critics as a weapon against the veracity of the Bible. Now, what a stark difference between Holford's time and our time. The point of these pre-dispensational writers was that Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the events leading up to it with such incredible accuracy that it is absolute and undeniable proof of His divinity. And this is exactly what it was meant to be. In the Olivet Discourse itself, our Lord says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Hold on to that thought. And all the tribes of the land will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Hold on to that thought also with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, this passage says two things about the Son of Man. First, there will appear a sign that he is in heaven. As David Chilton wrote, it is not the sign which is in heaven, but the Son of Man who is in heaven. The point is simply that this great judgment upon Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, will be the sign that Jesus Christ is enthroned in heaven at the Father's right hand, ruling over the nations and bringing vengeance upon His enemies. The divinely ordained cataclysm of A.D. 70, continues Chilton, revealed that Jesus Christ had taken the kingdom from Israel and given it to the church. The desolation of the old temple was the final sign that God had deserted it and was now dwelling in a new temple. This is exactly what Holford and those other predispensational writers were saying. And this is the view that Chilton restored when he wrote Paradise Restored. Basically, the fact that that temple came down within a generation of Yeshua's prediction was the sign that he was exactly who he said he was. He is the enthroned one over all the earth, ruling the world from heaven. So, this isn't saying a sign would appear in the sky. It's saying that Jerusalem's destruction was the sign that he was in heaven. But that's not to say there weren't visible signs in heaven. There most certainly were. The second thing that's said about the Son of Man is that they would see him coming on the clouds of heaven. And indeed, they did. And history records it for us. As Josephus reports it, not many days after that feast, on the 21st day of the month, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared, related by those who saw it. For before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running among the clouds and surrounding the city. Now, those of you who are already familiar with this quote know that this happened in April of A.D. 66 rather than in A.D. 70. So it's sometimes argued that this can't be the parousia. To say this, however, is to misunderstand the meaning of the word. We tend to look at the coming of Christ as a one-and-done, instantaneous event that's over in a split second. As Daniel Moraes reminds us, however, the Bible often uses the word parousia when mentioning the second coming, a Greek word meaning presence or coming. This is a word used to denote the arrival of a conquering general, emperor, or high-ranking official into a city for an extended stay. 
oftentimes for several months or years before returning to the capital city, the seat of his throne. The word connotes a coming and an extended presence or stay, often followed by a subsequent departure. When people think of the second coming or parousia, they often picture a one-time brief appearance of Christ on the clouds. However, this term generally connotes a coming and an extended stay or presence, as implied by the way parousia is used in Philippians 2.12. That passage reads, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I think we can safely assume that Paul's visitation to Philippi, his parousia, lasted longer than a split second. And this just shows how important it is to understand the usage of these words, terms, and phrases that are used in the Bible in the context of their own time. The Bible wasn't written in a vacuum, and it's a product of its own time. So just like when we speak and communicate today, the biblical writers are using the common vocabulary of their day. And the timing of Josephus' account perfectly fits that common vocabulary when it comes to the word parousia. It was a visitation. In fact, Yeshua even calls it the time of the city's visitation in Luke 1944. So the idea of an extended stay or visitation is going to stretch the event out over a period of time. It lasted from the beginning of the war in A.D. 66 to the time the temple was finally destroyed in A.D. 70. With this in mind then, notice the reference to the clouds in this passage. Yeshua told the Sanhedrin they would see him coming on the clouds of heaven, Mark 14.52. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. In Acts 1, he's taken to heaven in a cloud, and the disciples are told that he would come in the same way as they watched him go into heaven. He did, as Gary DeMar says, the passage says that Jesus will come in just the same way as he was seen going into heaven. He went up in a cloud, and he would return in a cloud. Jesus did this in his judgment coming against Jerusalem before that generation passed away. Now, Josephus also speaks of others who were seen in the skies over Jerusalem, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor. This comports well with Jude when he cites first Enoch and says, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all. Yosephon, who was a much-read and highly respected historical source by the Jews of the Middle Ages, chronicled the history of the Jews from Adam to the time of Titus. In his recounting of the events of Jerusalem's destruction, he writes, Now it happened after that there was seen from above the Holy of Holies for the whole night the outline of a man's face the like of whose beauty had never been seen in all the land, and his appearance was awesome. Moreover, in those days were seen chariots of fire and horsemen, a great force flying across the sky, near to the ground, coming against all the land of Judea, all of them horses of fire and riders of fire. Like Josephus, Yosephon mentions the chariots and horsemen in the sky, but he adds this detail. They were chariots of fire, horses of fire, and riders of fire. Remember, Paul told the Thessalonians that the Lord Jesus would be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. The fulfillment is recorded in Yosephon. And the reference to the outline of a man's face in the night sky 
which was both beautiful and awesome at the same time, is chilling when you consider the words of Revelation 6, 16. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? As Phil Kaiser says, so this non-Christian Jew is describing this appearance of a theophany in the shape of a man of stupendous size in the sky having a beauty that was awe-inspiring. This unbelieving Jew would have had no reason to make this kind of stuff up, especially since it could be used by Christians to prove the truth of Christ's spiritual coming to judge Israel. And then Kaiser goes on, I think this is an incredibly strong testimony coming from a Jewish historian. And I would definitely agree with Phil on this one. This is a pretty unbiased source. So you can see that God, in His divine providence, has equipped us with all the evidence we need to defend His Word and aptly demonstrate that our Lord came, just as He said He would, in that generation. And critics, quite frankly, don't know how to react to this kind of hard evidence. For example, John J. Collins retired professor of the Hebrew Bible at the University of Chicago. Now, Collins has written numerous works on a wide range of biblical topics. He believes, like Professor James Tabor, whom I quoted earlier, that Jesus and, that Jesus and Paul's apocalyptic expectations fail. That's a quote from him. When confronted with the text in Josephus, watch how Collins reacts. This is... Uh, Derek Lambert with Collins on his, as a guest on his show. Um, Here's the exchange. I've got one more pericope, well, maybe two more pericopes to bring up and get your thoughts on. We're not. The next one we're getting into is Josephus. There's this really interesting passage where, to to give you a little background, um, Jesus talks about there were, uh, for example, Matthew 16. There are some of you who are standing here will not taste death until the Son of Man comes with his angels to repay each man according to their deeds. I kind of have this memorized from all the years that I used to do this. And it's this idea that the angels will come with Jesus and Jesus talks about the son of man will come on the clouds. So you could see like one plus one, the way people connect the Bible, you have this idea that Jesus is going to come on the clouds with angels to repay each man according to their deeds. And this is the judgment that will finally come. They want to say this is 70 AD. And why? Look at Josephus. Josephus says, and they found this, and they go, ooh. And after the festival, not many days later, on the 21st of the month, Artemisium, I'm sorry, there appeared a miraculous phenomenon passing belief. Indeed, what I am about to relate would I imagine have been deemed a fable were it not for the narratives of eyewitnesses, because they're so trustworthy, um, and for the subsequent calamities, which have deserved to be signaled. For before sunset, through all, all the parts of the country, chariots were seen in the air and armed battalions hurtling through the clouds and encompassing the city. They, uh, cities, they say, don't you see, this is the final judgment on Jerusalem because Jesus talks about coming on the clouds. Isn't this Jesus coming on the clouds, Dr. Collins? Well, Josephus certainly didn't think it was Jesus coming on the clouds. Right. And that's pretty much, I just wanted to get his reaction. His only response to the evidence is, Josephus certainly didn't think this was Jesus coming on the clouds. But that's precisely the point. Josephus had no reason to lie, to make this up, or to embellish the truth. As Daniel Moraes puts it, if Jesus had been identified as the head of this army, it could be considered strong evidence that the account of the army in the clouds as a whole is a spurious Christian interpolation intended for apologetic purposes. Since as non-Christians unfamiliar with 
the details of Christian eschatology, Tacitus and Josephus would never be expected to make such an identification. Moraeus makes an excellent point here because this is exactly what critics do with the famous statement where Josephus supposedly recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. They say, well, obviously that line was inserted by a later Christian trying to make it look like Josephus accepted Jesus as the Christ. And they're probably correct, but that's just the point. With the statement about the armies in the sky, there's no tampering with the document. In the absence of a positive identification on the part of Josephus is actually strong evidence for its authenticity rather than the other way around. In other words, this isn't a Christian trying to prove that Jesus' prophecies came true. This is an unbiased source validating and substantiating that. Contrary to Collins, Tabor, and a host of other biblical scholars, Jesus and Paul's apocalyptic expectations did not fail. Quite the opposite. They were fulfilled to the letter. In a nutshell, you can sum it up like this. The New Testament writers predicted it before the fact, and Josephus records it after the fact. In his divine providence, God set it up this way. Thus, Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was, and these were the signs showing that the Son of Man is the enthroned one ruling from heaven, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And this includes biblical scholars who think he's nothing more than a failed and false prophet. So, why is preterism important and how does it apply to our lives? It's important because of the amount of space eschatology occupies in the New Testament. It applies to our lives because each and every one of us are called to defend the faith. And preterism is the absolute best way to do this as per the instructions of our Lord Himself. Again, Yeshua said the destruction of Jerusalem was to be the sign that He is the enthroned one seated in heaven. The word for sign carries the idea of a proof, a piece of evidence, or a convincing token. This is the evidence that He has left us to confirm His credibility, to defend His Word, and to hold all people accountable to His truth claims. So, rather than conceding ground to the critics and agreeing with them that, the, that these things weren't fulfilled, as dispensationalists and other futurists do, we maintain that they were fulfilled. And we use the evidence that the Lord in His providence has left us in the annals of history to show that they were fulfilled. We need to return to the approach of George Peter Holford before dispensationalism paralyzed the church. And Charles Spurgeon was alive when dispensationalism first began to paralyze the church and its doctrines were unfolding one by one. In classic Spurgeon style, this is what he had to say. We never know what we will hear next, and perhaps it is a mercy that these absurdities are revealed one at a time in order that we may be able to, to endure their stupidity without dying of amazement. you got to love Spurgeon. Uh, <laughs> and these absurdities, as Spurgeon has called them, have affected not only our apologetic effort, but they've hindered and hampered our role as God's image bearers in this world. And Spurgeon saw that train coming as well. In his famous sermon called On the Increase of His Government, he says, It would be easy to show that at our present rate of progress, the kingdoms of this world would never become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. Indeed, many in the church are giving up the idea 
except on the occasion of the advent of Christ. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Which, as it chimes with our own idleness, is likely to be a popular doctrine. Spurgeon goes on, I myself believe Jesus will reign and the idols will be utterly abolished. The Holy Ghost would never suffer the imputation to rest upon His holy name that He was not able to convert the world. Now, I'm a preterist, and I believe prophecy ceased in A.D. 70. So I'm using this term loosely here, but these words were prophetic, so to speak. This has become a popular doctrine, and it does chime with our own idleness. And when he said this, Spurgeon was looking ahead as the shadows were just beginning to be cast at the dawn of dispensationalism. Over a hundred years later, David Chilton was looking back at those shadows that had now been cast for decades once the dispensational stranglehold had completely crippled the church. What he wrote sums it up well. For too long, God's people have been characterized by despair, defeat, and retreat. For too long, Christians have heeded the false doctrine, which teaches that we are doomed to failure, that Christians cannot win. It's the notion that, until Jesus returns, Christians will steadily lose ground to the enemy. The future of the church, we were told, is to be a steady slide into apostasy. Some of our leaders sadly informed us we're living in a Laodicean age of the church, a reference to the lukewarm church of Laodicea, spoken of in Revelation 3, 14 through 22. <laughs> any new outbreak of war, any rise in crime statistics, any new evidence of the breakdown of the family was often oddly viewed as progress, a step forward toward the expected goal of the total collapse of civilization, a sign that Jesus might come rescue us at any moment. Social action projects were looked on with skepticism. It was often assumed that anyone who actually tried to improve the world must not really believe the Bible because the Bible taught that such efforts were bound to be futile. As one famous preacher put it, you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. That slogan was based on two assumptions. First, the world, the world is nothing more than a sinking ship. Second, any organized program of Christian reconstruction would be nothing more than polishing brass. Evangelism was an invitation to join the losing side. Now, remember when we said the New Testament writers predicted it before the fact and Josephus recorded it after the fact? We can almost say the same thing here. Spurgeon predicted it before the fact and Chilton recorded it after the fact. And today, God's people are still asleep in the light as Keith Green used to sing. There's a new virus. Praise God, it's a sign of the end. Russia invades Ukraine. Hallelujah, we have wars and rumors of wars. You know, throw in a few earthquakes here and there, and we have all the ingredients we need for Armageddon. This has been, and sadly continues to be, the dominant eschatology of the church. But this wasn't always so. And what has been the result of this absurd doctrine that Spurgeon warned us about? Well, Christians used to build hospitals and universities. We used to lead the way in science, education, philosophy, and in the arts. And there are many good books documenting all of this. These would include The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization by Vishal Mangawati. Under the Influence, How Christianity Transformed Western Civilization by Alvin J. Schmidt. What If Jesus Had Never Been Born by D. James Kennedy and Jerry Newcomb. Classic, great book. And Gary DeMar gives many examples in his three-volume God and Government series. All of these books show what Christians used to do 
before dispensationalism took our eyes off the world around us and on nothing but the sky above us as we wait for the rapture. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but God's people aren't doing these sorts of things anymore. Why? Because ideas have consequences. And we're living with the consequences of a really bad idea called premillennial dispensationalism. These books talk about a time when God's people had a vision of the future. It was a vision based on the idea that we are as image bearers, and as such, we should be leading the nations to the healing leaves of the tree of life, Revelation 22, 2. It was a vision of the nations walking by the light and glory of God, and the kings of the earth bringing the glory and honor of the nations into the new Jerusalem, Revelation 21, 24 through 26. In short, It was a vision of victory. As the late Dr. Gary North said, however, Christians haven't taken seriously this vision of victory since the 1870s. Notice the date. It coincides with dispensationalism. For over a century, this vision faded in the hearts and minds of regenerate people. A vision of defeat in time and on earth replaced the older vision of victory. The churches went into hiding, culturally speaking. They left the battlefield, and the humanists won by default. So this is the point to which dispensationalism has brought us. The humanists, as Dr. North says, have won by default. And God's people have failed in their task of being salt and light in the world. The world is supposed to see our good works and respond by glorifying our Father who is in heaven. In other words, we're supposed to be doing something. We're supposed to be engaged in activities that leave an impact on people, and as a result, those same people come to the Lord and embrace Christ. This was Old Testament Israel's mission as well, and now it's ours. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 7 says, See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep them and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples, who will hear all these statutes and judgments and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call upon Him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law that I am setting before you today? Now, according to 1 Peter 2, 9, we are now that holy nation, Jews and Gentiles alike. And the land we inherit isn't just the land of Canaan anymore. Holy ground is no longer restricted to the land of Israel. God has dissolved those boundaries, reclaimed those disinherited nations, and defeated their gods. That's part of what's new about the new heavens and new earth. The golden city of Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem, give me one second, Okay, yeah, that's where I was. Okay, the golden city of Revelation 21, the New Jerusalem, is 1,500 miles wide by 1,500 miles long. In other words, 1,500 square miles. It's the same number of square miles as the Roman Empire or the known world of the time. And as much as dispensationalists would like us to believe that the New Jerusalem is the biblical equivalent of a Borg cube, hovering over the earth, that's not what the cubical imagery is all about. The significance of the cubical shape of the city is that it matches the shape of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and the temple. The Holy of Holies is where the manifest presence of Yahweh resided, and it was overlaid with pure gold. As golden cubes, writes Desmond Alexander, 
The Holy of Holies and the New Jerusalem are clearly connected. G.K. Beale captures the significance of the imagery. He says, God's tabernacling presence, once limited to the Holy of Holies, was to be extended throughout the whole earth. Or as Ken Gentry puts it, the New Jerusalem is a symbol of the redeemed people of God, the people in whom God dwells. In other words, sacred space is no longer limited to the Holy of Holies in the temple in earthly Jerusalem. The shape and size of the city are meant to telegraph the idea that sacred space is anywhere on the face of this planet that a true believer is. Now, compare this with how it was in the Old Testament in the old heavens and earth. And we don't need to look any further than the story of Naaman in 2 Kings 5. Elisha heals Naaman of his leprosy, and Naaman says, Please let a load of dirt on a pair of mules be given to your servant, for your servant will never again bring a burnt offering and sacrifice to other gods, but only to Yahweh. So, he wants as much dirt from the land of Israel as his mules can carry to take back home with them to Syria. Why? It makes no sense. Dirt is the most abundant thing on earth. They didn't have dirt in Syria. Why would he ask for dirt? Because of his vow to sacrifice only to Yahweh alone and no other gods. That dirt from Israel was holy ground. It was Yahweh's turf. He needed dirt from the land of Israel to connect with the God of Israel. Guess what? We don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to haul dirt from Israel to connect with Him. It's all Yahweh's territory now, and anyone can be a part of His family right here and right now. Regardless of the color of our skin or where we live on this planet, we all belong to one of the nations that He has reclaimed through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He did it all between His first and second coming in the first century. And now, that golden city of Revelation 21 is supposed to expand and fill the whole earth. And the kings of the earth should be bringing the glory and honor of the nations into that city, into the city of the great king. The great king who, through his death, burial, and resurrection, became the ruler of the kings of the earth. But if this is true, if preterism is true, that means we have work to do, and people don't want to do that. For example... John MacArthur writes, Reclaiming the culture is a pointless, futile exercise. I'm convinced we're living in a post-Christian society, a civilization that exists under God's judgment. As we will note in an early chapter of this book, abundant evidence suggests that God has abandoned this culture to its own depravity and the church's only legitimate commission is the proclamation of the message of sin and salvation to individuals whom God sovereignly redeems and calls out of the world. Well, of course we're living in a post-Christian society. It's a post-Christian society caused by Christians abandoning society. And how do dispensationalists suggest we we respond to this post-Christian society caused by their eschatology. Their answer is to just continue down the same path that got us here in the first place. What they really want is to justify their complacency. As Mike Sullivan says, it makes the sleeping giant of the evangelical church numb to getting involved in our culture and politics because they expect things to simply get worse so they can get raptured just before it gets really bad. 
After all, you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. We must, says Mike, get involved in our politics and be the salt and light of this great country and that of the world. Amen, Mike. Amen, Mike. Or, as my friend William Bell puts it, finding ways to improve the world in which we live is the mandate of fulfilled eschatology. But the sad fact is that most believers today don't want to do anything to improve the state of the world or better the state of of our culture. They want to think things are supposed to be this way because these are the end times. That way, they can continue to have no other goal in life other than to wait for Jesus to come and rescue them out of the world. In the meantime, Jesus is waiting for His people to wake up and finally start changing the world. He'll do it through us, but He's not going to do it for us. Again, Revelation 1.5 says, Jesus Christ is, right here and right now, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. As David Chilton said, as firstborn, Christ possesses the crown rights of all creation. All authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he claimed. All nations have been granted to him as his inheritance, and the kings of the earth are under court order to submit to him. And we are his representatives who are supposed to be issuing this court order to the world. We are his image bearers. He's done his part. We need to do our part. And this is why it always amazes me when people ask, well, if preterism is true, what are we supposed to be doing now? Preterism is the only eschatology that gives us something to do now. It is. And it alone is the true eschatology of victory. Under every other eschatology, God's people, His image bearers, ultimately fail in the end, and our only hope is for Jesus to come and bail us out. It is only under the preterist approach that every prophesied obstacle is removed and the future is wide open. And the only thing that stands in our way is we ourselves and our failure to be the salt and light in this world that He has called us to be. And once God's people begin to realize this and we begin to see that all the doomsday prophecies are behind us, we will begin to turn the tide and we can begin to successfully defend His Word as we're all called to do. So when people ask, why is this important? And how does this apply to my life? It's important because if preterism isn't true, the Bible's nothing more than a book of failed and false prophecies, as men like Tabor and Collins contend. And there's no reason to apply it to our lives. What would be the point? We might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. On the other hand, if preterism is true, then we have every reason to apply God's Word to our lives. The destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 confirms its authenticity, and it's the standard by which we are called to live and in which we will be judged. And by applying it to our lives, this means every area of life. We are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, not just some of them. There's no reason to do this if he's a failed and false prophet, and every reason to do it if he is exactly who he said he was. So, why is preterism important? Bottom line, because in a very real way, everything we're all about and who we are depends on it. Um, This is the reality of it, whether the dispensationalist wants to admit it or not, and this is why preterism is so very important. So, I hope that, you know, this, you know, can be helpful to you in some way when you're confronted with those kind of questions, when you're uh, sharing preterism with your friends, your family members, your co-workers, or whatnot. And having said that, I suppose it's time for me to take some questions. 
So um, I don't know if any, anybody got any questions or anything coming in, David. One of the listeners wrote in, wow, just wow. Oh, <laughs> that, <laughs> I'll send you your check later. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Rick, what's up? So with Josephus and Tacitus, and then I said, yeah, yes, yeah, Josephon, yeah. Don't know if I pronounced his name right, no, no, but that's, I'm just curious. I'm that's the Bob Crookshank, Youngstown, Ohio pronunciation <laughs> of that <it>. yeah. <laughs> Jewish scholar. Yeah. Yeah, I also read inside in that very, very area, and this really isn't a question as much as just agreeing yeah. with you. That they heard a voice that said, let us go from hence. Oh, that's in Josephus, yeah. In Josephus, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's right there at the Holy of Holies where they heard it. And I think it's in 66 when I, I, I th yeah, I can't remember, but yeah, it's right there it's at the Holy of Holies. Yeah. It wasn't man's voice, they could hear it. From yeah. yeah, 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 there's there's a lot in Josephus. There is, so. there is. And the Tacitus quote, um, yeah. Marius referred to it, but I actually didn't include that. That's a pretty, pretty good quote, too. Um, but yeah, yeah. Mike? You know, I've seen debates by, like, say, James White <laughs> debating a Muslim, uh, yeah. Ali. And he wins the debate hands down until the Muslim starts taking the liberal critics' arguments. And he says, Well, I can't believe in your Jesus of the New Testament because he was a false prophet. Mm. And then it just falls apart and to, unless they become a president. Now, Doug Wilson debated. A skeptic, and that uh, argument came up. Yeah. But even Doug Wilson, in his partial preterism, can't fully answer it because Paul in First Thessalonians four and in First Corinthians fifteen yeah. says we, you know, yeah. and they can't deal with those passages. I think it was I think it was Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. That yeah, and Doug Wilson, like you said, did a pretty good job, but you could tell that he took Hitchens off guard. Like he Hitchens did. had no idea that was coming. If Christopher Hitchens would have done his homework, right. he could have come right back at him exactly. and pushed him toward the direction of full preterism, and it would have been interesting to see how Wilson would have handled that. Right. But, Gary? Bob, I'm always like, let the people know that they can write a question in the same number they always do. They oh. oh, it's about to head to the it's screen. on the screen. Okay. 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 Um, Holford? Uh, George Peter Holford, I think. This, the book uh, that uh, talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. Being fulfilled. So seemingly, um, the church was pretty much stable up to that point. I don't... When, my question is, when did it start? I mean, dispensationalism hadn't even arrived yet. When did the church start to abdicate its responsibility? When dispensations are 70 AD. That's <laughs> <laughs> about right. Yeah. No, it's it seems to me that it just seems to me there's a direct correlation between when the church just lost touch culturally and started taking a back seat and the rise of dispensationalism. And I'm not trying to say that like the church was perfect up to that point. I'm not even trying to say the church was full preterist up mm -hmm. to that point, but you can't deny the fact that when it came when it comes to passages like Matthew 24, you know, commentary after commentary, they just it's not even a big deal to them. It's just like you get an older commentary, they run through it and it's like, "Oh, obviously this is talking about destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70." You know, it's just par for the course. And obvious another thing that's obvious is like the church used to like do more in the world, you know? And I look at the whole thing as if we're going to be here for a long time, like we're still in the infancy stages of it. So like all for 2,000 years, the church has been growing and learning and coming to maturity. And uh, I think a big roadblock came when dispensationalism became popular and we need to just jettison it. We need to jettison it. Yeah. I guess yesterday that um, preterism needs to be the main message of Christianity. Oh. Because it, it, it answers everything because there's no reason to, like you say, run and hide and wait for the yeah. second coming. We, it's growing. I don't think, honestly, I mean, I'm not saying, okay, don't, I'm not saying you have to be a preterist to be a Christian. I'm not saying that. But you cannot defend Christianity without preterism. The attacks from those guys like Collins and Tabor, they're, they're just, they're coming 
more and more and they're becoming stronger. And like I said, ironically, they're coming from the same passages that guys like George Peter Holford used to use to defend Christianity. And because we've done such a horrible job handling the word of truth, now those passages are used to, you know, attack Christianity. It's like a, a seminar need to be done with every man who's teaching his word, God's word, need to, I mean, it needs to seem like, I know it's sound weird, but a, a large mass of people, all of, everybody should just go back to school and go, you know, and be retaught. <laughs> yeah. You know. And, We're and, trying you know, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because sharing the word, people listen. People oh, yeah. listen to anything, but yeah. if, if it comes from, you know, from the people who's teaching God's word so people can really learn the true oh, yeah. word of God, you know, so right. like it needs to be bombarded there. And well, like when, Somehow. It, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to dispensationalism, I mean, I was kind of hard on them today. Like some of my best friends, and I love them in the Lord, are dispensationalists. I really don't, I mean, the people in the pews are one thing, but the leaders that should know better, I have no compassion for whatsoever. Um, they should know better. The people in the pews, you know, these these are people that, are, that they're living life. They, they got jobs. They have families. They don't have time to sit down and study this stuff. They want to get their teaching through turning somebody on and getting teaching. And they're trusting these people to study God's word and give them good, solid teaching. So I don't fault those people. They don't really, like most people don't have the time to dig, you know. I mean, they have time to read the Bible, but not dig. But the teachers... That's a whole nother story. They should know better. Mike. So, like you said, Bob, I mean, it's not that these pastors need to be re-educated. It's that they need to implement hermeneutics, yeah. which is what they were taught yeah. in seminary, in mm -hmm. Bible college, mm -hmm. homiletics, and yeah. they're not doing it. They're just going to their cookie-cutter commentaries that yeah. their seminary told them, and then they're oh, just yeah. regurgitated. That's it. Plus, I think there might be a little bit, you know... You start telling people, you know, Christians used to build hospitals and universities and lead the way in science and we need to get to work. You start telling people that they have to work, they have to do something. <laughs> you might start, those pews might start being empty because yeah. we're human beings. We're prone to laziness. People just don't want to hear this. And that's another reason, honestly, why I think people are so resistant to preterism. Um, because if preterism is true... We have work to do. The world's a mess. And Jesus isn't coming to rescue us out of here. He left us here. So, like, if we want it to be better for our kids and grandkids, we better start doing something about it, you know? Big churches, big houses, and airplanes. Yeah. Not hospitals and helping people. Exactly. Gary. Not, not to be a, a judge of Tabor and Collins and those guys, but are they really Christian? Oh, you know what? I have no idea. And Mike and I were talking about this yesterday. John Collins, like, we've read his stuff. He's written a lot of books on a lot of different topics. I had no idea he had this view. Generally speaking, he's pretty good. You know, you're reading the stuff, but he never gets into this. He's just, he's talking about Daniel or whatever. So you, I, I honestly, I, you know, that's between them and God, but I don't know how you could think Jesus is a failed and false prophet. Why would you worship him? Yeah. Well, well Collins even admits that there's apocalyptic language yeah. in the Old Testament. But then he comes to Jesus' teaching and says, well, Jesus was teaching the end of the physical planet. And yeah. So, and then in his Daniel commentary, he says, we need to rethink the resurrection. It's not necessarily physical. I know. But then he criticizes Jesus and that the Bible yeah. is false because there wasn't a physical... You can't have it both ways, and that's why you won't debate us. Yeah, but, um, well, John <laughs> writes in, uh, great, helpful, and encouraging teaching. Oh, thank you, John. I, I think the, the first thing that has to happen to change the situation is we have to re-educate. Okay, that's what happens. But, and that happens through what we're doing here. We're teaching the Word. It happens through what Rick's doing with the yeah, podcast. With the podcast we, we, yeah, podcast. It happens with Mike's doing. Well, Mike, you know, recording stuff oh, you know, yeah. on Facebook. We have to educate them what Glenn does. You know, Glenn goes into church and, and teaches the truth and then gets thrown out. Yeah. That has to happen <laughs> more. 
we have to educate them yeah and we have to that's where we have to start yeah because nothing's going to happen until people's thinking changes on this yeah and then i think you know like whatever your field of interest is whatever you're going into whatever your occupation is like you know the bible says do all things to the glory of god like motivate people to make a difference make an impact and you know be that salt and light so that people see our good works and uh you know come to the lord as a result of what we're doing not just what we're saying you know they're supposed to see our good works and that brings them to the lord yes verbally sharing the gospel is good but there's a whole another you know dimension to it that i think we miss because we're waiting for the rapture <laughs> but okay i think is that are we